why we learn here together. We normally discover all kinds of different rabbis and opinions and places and all kinds of things that we may have not been taught before or have not heard about before. And very often these rabbis are Sephardic rabbis. Very obvious the reason because most people don't know anything about Sephardic Jews or Sephardic rabbis and that's why when you hear something from a Sephardic rabbi, could be someone Sephardic has heard this before but not somebody American or outside of that camp. When I was in New York now, I came across uh, four volumes of books, these two being a classic and other two that I never heard of before, by a rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg. Not a Sephardic rabbi, I'll tell you that much. Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg is known as the Sride Esh, survivors of the fire, after a, a response that he wrote, halachic uh, questions and answers, called Sride Esh, the, the survivors of the fire, after surviving the Holocaust. And, uh, leaving Europe, he wrote these books on halakha and many other volumes in the Talmud and all kinds of things. And his writings are famous. People have heard of the Sridesh. Very few people have studied the Sridesh because there are opinions of his that the Jewish world did not want to understand or did not want to accept. And so I think most Orthodox rabbis, if you ask them, have you heard of Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg? They'll say yes. And if you ask them, do you know what he believed in? They'll tell you no because that's kind of where he's been put in history. You're allowed to know his name, but don't know too much more about him aside from that. What's his first name? Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg. So he's like Hosea? Yeah, but different. He's Ashkenazi, so his worldview is going to be different. But you'll find again that there are places where all the, all the truth seekers cross at some point in time. Regardless of where they come from and where they were going, their lives always intersect. And if you find righteous people who's paths don't cross these paths, then it's just because they were not as truthful as the other ones, because you'll find that regardless of the countries we came from, there was always somewhere that we crossed paths. Always one, one, two, three, ten, a hundred views that were the same, that came from two very different places. I don't know what the relation is. I don't, I'm assuming there's a lot of Weinbergs, but I, I, don't, I don't know of there being an open relationship there. Um, and the reason I want to share a piece with you is because of two things. One, I got the shipment of books on Friday morning, and when I opened up this book that I just saw for a few minutes at the bookstore, I almost went into Shabbat reading it. I could not stop reading this book. It was a. Uh, you don't find minds like that anywhere. Anywhere. It's a different person, a different personality, a different style of writing, a different approach. Uh, different. And different is always good. It's always something nice to read, refreshing to read. No, not in, not that I know of. Yeah. It's because the good things they don't want you to know. <laughs> and there was the second thing was the piece that I happened to be reading at the time was it wasn't what they tell us. It wasn't the same routine Torah that we're always hearing, the same things that we're taught to believe that are true, they're not. They were radically different. And the radical different part was the part that I really wanted to learn about today. So I, I made some photocopies. I don't know if I have enough for everybody, but we can hand them around and share. But maybe just a few words about Rabbi Weinberg. He was born in the 1800s and passed away in 1966. So he was born in Poland. And he kind of bridged the two generations of old school Europe and New World Judaism in Israel. Where did he live in the States? I don't know that he lived in the States. I believe he lived in Israel. Um, he was born in Israel? He was born in Poland. 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 In the 1800s. Wait, when he, did, when he was a student of the Musar movement. You know the, the Musar movement, they call it. What is Musar? What is the world of Musar? Ethics. Okay. Ethics, but it was a movement, meaning just like Hasidut, we always studied righteousness, but Hasidim hijacked the name and turned it into a movement. So too, these people hijacked the word Musa and turned it into a movement. Ethics, but they were started by a person named... Very good. Rabbi Salant Salanta. Rabbi Salant from Salant started a, a movement in which he believed the Jews had to focus more on character refinement, on improving themselves. People were not such fans of the Musa movement. Even though today, in normal Orthodox communities, you'll hear names like Rabbi Israel Salanta, these were not accepted names in European Jewry for a very long time. For two reasons. One, they were the antithesis of the Hasidic movement. 
these two were fighting each other forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But there's a whole book about it right here. My wife just bought it. Of course, this one means the Hasidim one. That's the name of the book. But you know, it's a non-biased opinion to the arguments that happen that happen there. Uh, and then you had a second group of people which were just very wary about the extreme measures that the people in the Musaya movement took in order to refine themselves. They viewed them as a little bit rigid, a little bit harsh, a little bit brutal, a little bit extreme. And they were very wary of, why do we have to start changing the way we've always lived our lives? This is the way we've done it, this is the way our parents have done it, why do we have to start buying into your new shenanigans? It's a normal attitude in the Jewish community when someone comes up with a good idea. Other people are going to say, hey, why do we have to change? We're orthodox, that means we never change. Huh? Illiterate people who don't know our own history can tell you that we've never changed. But the Bali Musa knew better, and they continue, they continue on their path. And maybe there are some more modern day names that you know of the Musa movement. The Chavetz Chaim was definitely part of the Musa movement. Um, you know Rabbi Wolbe, I've mentioned him too before. Uh, Rabbi Dessler, Strive for Truth, was a student of the Musa movement. Um, Rabbi Eliyahu Lopian from Gateshead was part of the Muslim movement. These are names you've probably seen before in books, and they're all part of this umbrella movement called the Balei HaMusal. Now, even though that was a very Eastern European movement, there was another group of Ashkenazi Jewry that was at odds with the Musal movement. Do you know who they were? I told you about Eastern Europe, so you tell me about... It has to be the German group. Very good. Western Europe. Yes. The Jews of Germany always lived in a very different circle. Than, so there were no shtetls and there was no you know, fiddler on the roof. It was a very different Jewish community. Correct. Anybody here from a German Jewish background? Good. Oh my God, Is that why you're on time to things? No, the German I'm Jews not, are like. I'm not yes. my mother, I'm not you're not on time. Well, Absolutely you got the bad yes. side of the inheritance. So I don't know, yet because sometimes people see it as a bad word, sometimes it's a good word, I don't know. But there's still a German-Jewish community in New York, yes. um, a very vibrant, actually, uh, German-Jewish community. They had an interesting struggle. When the whole world was struggling with the reform movement, the capital of the reform movement was? In Germany, in Berlin especially. So they didn't have a struggle, they pretty much lost. It just was, they didn't even get a chance to struggle with the reform movement. Just German Jewry became reform. And that question was very quickly, so how do we retain our orthodoxy when the whole world is, is going in that direction? It's not like Eastern Europe where they were, they, they reinforced their bubbles and closed themselves up even tighter in the shtetl and refused to learn how to speak the language or whatever it was. <coughs> the German Jews didn't have that luxury. And they didn't want to. Many German I... Jews didn't even speak Yiddish. Um, uh, Germany, Bichlal, Hasidut very rarely crossed over the border into Germany. There were a few Hasidic groups. They're not really Hasidim. They're called, do you know what they're called? The Hasidic German Jews? If I'm teaching Ashkenazi history, this is the bad world. The Oberlander Jews. Have you heard of Oberlanders? Yes. No? yes. What does Oberland mean? It's, it's exactly what it sounds like. Like from the other side of the world, you know, from Germany. That was the. They're a very interesting group of Jews. They kind of fall in between the Hasidic and the non Hasidic circles. In Germany, you had a rabbi start a movement to react towards what was happening in Europe, but especially in Germany. His name was Rabbi Shamshon Hirsch. Hirsch, very good. Rabbi Shamshon Raphael Hirsch. Rabbi Hirsch, you've seen him in the bottom of the art scroll, Chumash, and you've seen him all over the place. Rabbi Hirsch. The famous Rabbi Hirsch. Rabbi Hirsch started a movement which I beg to differ that it's called this, but uh, secular philosophers like to call it Neo-Orthodoxy. I don't like the term so much. I don't believe that was accurate, but they like to put him in his own box. Rabbi Hirsch founded the famous quote, Torah in Derch Eretz. You should have Torah. Derch Eretz here is not referring to manners and etiquette. Obviously, that, that comes before. Yeah, what do we say? Having, being a person, a good person, is, is before you become religious, you have to be a good person. If you find someone who's religious, but they're not a good person, they, they miss the whole point. They, they're not in the right boat. But there's another kind of derech eretz referred to in the Gemara. You know what it means? 
It says in Perkei Avot, Yafa Torah in Derech Eretz. It is good to have Torah with Derech Eretz. With... I'll give you another quote. You know what I'm talking about when I say this. Perkei Avot says, Im en kemach en Torah. If there's no flower, there's no Torah. What does that mean? Very good. You have to work. You have to be involved in the world. How are you going to learn Torah if you don't have food in your, in your house? You have to have one to have the other one. So he believed that it was possible to integrate traditional Jewish values with the secular world that everybody was living in. And that was a very um, mind-blowing concept for Eastern European Jews. You have to remember this not Sephardic Jewry where we had doctors and scientists and philosophers and mathematicians and artists and musicians. This is Europe where Jews were just Jews. They dealt career-wise, they were not allowed to study. Working-wise, they were not allowed to work in most fields. And they were normally merchants or peddlers or people that were dealing with very low-grade uh, work. Because the non-Jews didn't allow, they didn't allow for Jews to integrate into society. All the things we were allowed to get our hands on, we did. And we did it well. And so to have a rabbi that stands up, and he has a little bit of a trimmed beard, and a, a little bit more of a modern look, he dresses differently than the rest of the rabbis in Europe, and he stands up and says, there's a way to integrate these two. You can imagine what the reaction was going to be from the Jews around him. A lot of criticism. Who do you think you are? You're, you're modern, you're breaking tradition, you're uh, all kinds of accusations. They leveled against Rav Hirsch. Rav Hirsch, though, was a, a, a genius. He knew what was going to happen before it happened. And Rav Hirsch changed a few things. Rav Hirsch felt that many people were running to the Reform synagogues because they didn't speak Yiddish in the Reform synagogues. A German Jew who wanted to be German, wanted to be cultured, you don't speak uh, uh, some street language called Yiddish. You speak German. German is the refined language of the cultured world. And so Rav Hirsch said, we're going to switch our language on the synagogues to German. No more Yiddish. Now, if that wasn't enough to get him in trouble, according to Ashkenazi Jewish tradition, how many times a year? Tell us to your rabbi. How many times a year is the rabbi supposed to speak in public? Twice. Twice. Very good. When? Shabbat Gadol, the Shabbat before Pesach, and Shabbat Shuvah, the Shabbat before Yom Kippur. In Europe, the only times rabbis ever spoke in public were twice a year. Never else. Not on Shabbat, not on holidays. It was considered beneath the dignity of a rabbi to teach. Again, it's a polar opposite from what we're used to today, and the extreme opposite of what Sephardic Jewry was used to. But in Europe, the, 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 the office of the rabbi was, he was a learned person. He was writing books. He was educating himself. He was there to deal with the academic part of the community not the day-to-day -day community struggles. Like, I'm sorry, he also dealt with the community problem situation. In later day Europe. Oh. Not, in, not in the earlier days of European Jewry. Did that attitude lead to... A lot of problems. The, uh, the reform movement? It led to people what? feeling very disconnected from the rabbinate. Of course. Very much that the rabbis were not with the people. They weren't. I mean, it had its pluses. The rabbi was able to actually be a rabbi and not be a, a social worker and a therapist and a shochet and a mohel. But clearly, I'm not from this model of, of rabbis. But the idea was, how are you going to have all these books if the rabbi doesn't have time to write them? So it was about what person in comparison to the, the community team. felt, for example. Why do universities feel that they should support PhD students? What do they help us? They're just going to study? They felt that if they study and they research, they'll eventually end up contributing their knowledge to the world, and so we as a community would want to support such people for the long-term benefit of the Jewish people. But who is condemned to read all these books if they have no education they're not connected to Jewish people? So for that, in Europe you had rabbis that were cheder rabbis, they called them, um, rebels. they were like a little um, you know, they, they taught the kids Aleph Bet and you had Magidim what was the Magid? You know, the Magid speaks the Magid says, what is a Magid? He, he was a traveling teacher, he would go to different towns and he was the one who gave speeches that was part of European Jewry was they had Magidim, people 
who went around and taught instead of the Rebbe. You know the downside of having somebody outside of your community teaching your community? They don't know. He doesn't know the community. He doesn't know who you are. And very often Magidim would come from out of town into a new town and they would they would upset people or they would uh, offend them or they would scream at them, you should do this, you should do that. And they leave. And then they left. So it was like a, we call them a hit and run. Yeah. You know all these guest lecturers that come to San Diego? Not against them. I've been a guest lecturer in many places. But there are many Jews whose staple of learning is from the guest lectures. They like to be part of the hit and run scene. They go, someone comes to town, they give a nice speech and they leave. What you don't know is that this person gives the same nice speech everywhere they go. That's right. Ask them to give a speech 10 days in a row, and then you'll see, do they really know what they're talking about? I'm not taking away from them. They have, there's a place for them in Jewish uh, community life. But when they become the authority, when they become the people who you call, when they become, that's who we should be like, it's very false, because you've only experienced the person for an hour, for two hours, for one day, for one Shabbat. You don't actually know what they're really like. You don't know what they look like when they're at home. You've never seen them with their wife or with their kids. You don't know if they really understand the community. They're just coming and telling you the same generic message they tell everyone else in the world. Most people who ask me, I don't, I don't suggest such style of learning. But it does it for some people. So for some people, that's where they should go. But if that's the staple of your learning, you will get a very confused Jewish message. Because if you have many different people that teach many different hit-and-run kinds of Torah, then you'll get very confused. But I won't speak about this topic too much. Or I'll, I'll, no, it's interesting. Or I'll be ranting. No, it is. It's very, <laughs> it's very interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm happy. Because actually you gave us a, te- a test in thought um, what it was like with the Magidim. Well, it's this was, this was the what rabbi. they were. Right. And you should know the rabbis and the Magidim were always fighting with each other. I can understand Because that. the rabbis would say, hey, this is my community. Mm-hmm. I've been raising them. I've been telling them this is okay, this is not okay. Suddenly you show up from uh, Vilna, or wherever you came from, and you're telling them that they're going to go to hell, and you're telling them that... that but how the can you come himself and... didn't speak to her, or how, what, can, what can he do? I mean, he doesn't have a right to tell them anything. Very good, anything. very good. Absolutely. So, like... so then what else happened in Europe? They started a movement in, in Valazhan called the Yeshiva Movement. Also, we always had Yeshiva, but now it was a movement. Started by the Vilna Gaon student, Rabbi Chaim of Valazhan. They opened up the famous Yeshiva of Valazhan. You know who learned there? The Briska Rav was a rabbi there. Ah. Rabbi Cook studied in Valazhan. Like Chaim Nachman Bialik studied in Valazhan. Really? Bialik studied in Valazhan? I thought he was it was, little. You thought he was? He was a little. He, was a he, little he, little. he ended up leaving the Yeshiva world. But he started off in the really? same circles as everyone else did. Interesting. You had um, a lot of great minds that came out of this world. Why am I telling you about them? You suddenly had a new kind of struggle. You had the community rabbi, and then you had the yeshiva rabbi. When you send your youth, imagine now, we did, I did it, they send you out of San Diego to yeshiva. So who becomes your rabbi? Is it your rabbi that you spent your years studying with in yeshiva? that you really learned with every single day that you grew from, that you connected to? Or is it the rabbi of the town in which you live? Rabbi. Let's say you come back and get married. Who does the wedding? I would want the rabbi who I lived. The rabbi of the town does. or the rabbi from yeshiva? The rabbi who I lived was from the yeshiva. The rabbi from the town doesn't know me. He knew you since you were in diapers. He doesn't, doesn't matter, he might have known who I was, what family I came from, he doesn't really know me. So this, by the way, caused a very big disconnect between the yeshiva rabbi and the community, I have a whole book on it, and the community rabbi. Like and to this day, this fight still exists, yeah. between mm-hmm. the yeshiva rabbi and the community rabbi. To the point where somebody like me, when I studied in Ashkenazi yeshiva, and I decided I was going to be a community rabbi, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating to you. I might as well have decided that I was going to drop out of Yeshiva. Huh. There was no difference. Why would you want to be like them? What do they know? They sit there all day long teaching people how to pray. Do they really know how to learn? They give sermons, but do they really know how to, to study? And there became this elitist attitude of the Yeshiva rabbis versus the community rabbis. 
but traditionally the community rabbi was the one who had all the honor and all the respect and not the yeshiva rabbi. So who trumps who? This is a fight that's still going on. Albeit silently, but it's still going on. It doesn't have to be a fight. Everybody has their place. Has I'm going to pause for a moment. I want to pause. One second. When I left Yeshiva, so there are still friends of mine that are still there. Which means that where I left, there are people that now have four years, five years, six years more learning than I do. And come 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, it's the normal way of life that I will call them up for questions. When I don't know something, I'll call the one who was once upon a time in my class, but now has 20 more years of learning under his belt. Bazaar the Shem, of course, but in my peer circles, because it's normal. It's normal that there will be people like us who chose to leave the world of yeshiva. We still study, but not as intensely or as organized as in yeshiva. And it's normal for us. It doesn't take away from our, our ego or our honor or respect to call somebody else to ask. But the moment those people start infiltrating the community, that's when people start to get very worried. But these people don't know anything else other than just to study. They don't, they don't, they're not earning a living, they're not keeping their families, they're not doing anything, so what good are they? No, so the... the I have a problem with The that. call-outs that come to a community like San Diego, normally what you'd have is men who are teaching the community and ladies who are teaching in the schools. And so it's kind of, instead of having to hire random teachers from all over the place, you bring three or four families, and they take care of, of all the things that a community needs to do. A mohel, a shochet, whatever it would be that would happen in a town. It's an American invention, this, this community kolel thing. But the reason it doesn't happen in some places is because of this long-time fight between the yeshiva rabbi and the community rabbi. And very often a yeshiva rabbi will come and doesn't know how to properly respect the community rabbi. It's your community. I'm stepping into your bound. For example, I have certain customs that I do. But when I go to another community, I don't do them. Because now I'm in somebody else's territory. And doing them, even though I'm allowed, I'm allowed to a free world, I can do whatever I want to do. But I know that by doing them, I might make the other rabbi look... And that, it's not true, but I might make him look less religious or, or weird or whatever it would be. So I'm careful just not to do them. Because when you step into someone else's territory, you also have to know how to be respectful of the, the situation which you're walking Brandy. into. Yes. So I'm telling you all this. Because in Germany, you had a movement that was started by Rav Hirsch and continued by a rabbi, Hildsheimer. Have you heard of that name? Mm -hmm. Very famous. He started the first school for boys and girls, separately, to study Torah. We hear about the Beis Yaakov movement and all that, but nobody tells you about Rabbi Hildsheimer. But the thing here was that they taught secular studies. In a Jewish setting, yeshiva, but studied secular studies. Rabbis that were also professors in universities. And the Sri Daesh went from Europe to yeshiva, uh, to university in Germany and got his PhD in uh, the Masoretic texts. Torah. He got a PhD. He was an academic. So Rav Weinberg was also a big posek, a Torah scholar, and also in that world of academia was considered a professor. He was a, a, a doctor which is not a normal thing in the 1800s in Europe. He had a big problem when he came to Germany. He saw the crazy things the German Jews did. For example, the reform movement stole a nice thing from the Christian movement. I don't know if it's nice, but they did it anyways. Which was that in the middle of Tefillah they had music. music. But not real music, because you can't play music, but they had a choir. Have you ever been to a German Jewish synagogue? Yes. In South Africa they have this also. Yes. But this comes from the German side, not from the Lithuanian side. Choirs in the middle of Tefillah. Now, I was once, I was once in the Tefillah, and there was a choir. I started laughing at the beginning, and then I left because I felt like I was in a Catholic church. I, I just cannot tell you the feeling of what you feel like when. Now, some people love this. I'm not putting down that. Fi For some people, this reminds them of home. And this is the way they prayed. For me, that's. A choir? What's a choir doing here? They have a conductor? It's like a whole thing that's going in the middle of Fila. It's like a concert. But for some people, that's the... So when I first went to uh, Washington Heights in New York, and I prayed with the German Jewish community, it's a serious thing. The choir is not a joke. It's part of the... They train all the time. Yeah, they train. They, train. they have special robes and hats yes, and, yes, and all yes. kinds of yes. things. And the... okay. I told you, I felt like I was in the church. But it's the old tradition of German Jewry. Because the Christians did it, so the reform movement adapt, adopted it from them. Because they wanted to attract 
the young Jews who were going to Christianity, they wanted to attract them, so to speak, to the Reformed temples. And when the Orthodox movement said, hey, people are leaving our boring, dry services because they love the choir next door, so Rabbi Hirsch also instituted a choir into his services. How do you think this all went down in Eastern Europe? It didn't. They hated it. They had a really hard time. Especially the Hasidic movement. Ironically, the Hasidic movement, who was now being persecuted their whole life, now decided, you know, the way that the one who was bullied always becomes the bully afterwards. They decided, hey, we're going to fight with Hirsch. Interesting enough, though, the Lithuanian Jews were very accepting of Rav Hirsch, on one condition. That Rav Hirsch, the border of Germany is here. Nothing that you do crosses over the lines of the Eastern Europe. We let you do whatever you feel you need to do in Germany. But none of this. We will not have in our shtetls a synagogue that speaks German. And we will not have such a thing that their rabbi will speak every Shabbat. No, we will not have such a thing that there will be a choir in the middle of our services. There will be no secular studies in America. You could do whatever you need to do in Germany. Contain yourself. And that was the attitude of most of Ashkenazi Jewry. We respect reverse, but contain yourself. Keep yourself into Germany. Don't come out. Yeshiva University, which was founded in New York, and though the German Jewish movement would not take credit for Yeshiva University, their slogan was Torah Umada. Torah and science, and they are a break off from this German Jewish group of Rav Hirsch. That's, by the way, why there has been a long time fight between the Yeshiva world and Yeshiva University, because for them you're a little bit too modern. You were only warranted in Germany, not in America, and there's still that fight going on today. And sometimes people they look at Jewish struggles. You have to know Jewish history to know why certain things happen. And if you don't know it, You'll never understand. Rav Weinberg became a rabbi in Germany. He was a teacher for Rav Hildsheimer. And the biggest struggle he had when he first came for Shabbat, he writes on the Sridej, he said, I was sitting at the Shabbat table, and there were girls singing at the Shabbat table. He said, in a Jewish house? In a Jewish house, girls are going to sing on Shabbat? He went crazy. Uh, very upset. In, in the shtetl, I guess. Ladies didn't do anything at the Shabbat table, aside from serve the food. Singing was not part of the... Why? The Talmud says that uh, a, a man cannot hear a lady's voice singing. So how could it be that she's singing at the Shabbat table? And then he said, but I went and I saw... Thank you. I saw Rav Hildheimer. I saw that all the rabbis didn't say anything about it. So I figured there must be a reason for it. And he wrote one of his most famous letters saying that so long as it's done in a group and the songs that are being sung are Jewish songs, men and women are allowed to sing together. Who's who sang that? Rabbi Weinberg. Rabbi Weinberg. Weinberg. So he did a complete turn from when he entered Germany and when he got settled into Germany. Probably for a letter like this, that's the reason why most of you have never heard of Rabbi Weinberg. Mm. Because he approved of women singing at the He approved of things that you should not have approved of them in your time. Today, this is not even a question. I mean, we're, we're, people always say, Shalom Aleichem, Meshach Chayim. Now there are, I'll tell you, when I go to New York, let's say, and I'm by certain family members, it's true, the men are the only ones sitting at the table. The ladies sit there. Really? Like that. So when I once ask, how come you're not singing? I know why they're not singing. Oh, why should I sing Eshel Chayim to myself? I said, okay, you're right, but what about Shalom Aleichem? What about, uh, I don't know, Jeroy Yikra, whatever they were singing? It's okay. Rev. Weinberg says you should never force a person to do something they're not comfortable with. But it is allowed. And he gave a very interesting halachic reason for it. Should we go there? Should we? Yes, yes, yes. Because I printed papers. It's not on the paper. Yes. In Judaism, you have a rule. But if you have a halacha, but there is an exception to this halacha, one exception on its own is not enough to uproot a halakha. But if you can combine two exceptions, two svekot as we call them, to a halakha you can, you can change the halakha. When, when did they come out? It's always been, well I'll tell you why, because the, the logic is very simple. 
halakha is determined by one rabbi. Let's say Shulchan Aruch, right? So if you have another opinion that's arguing on the Shulchan Aruch, so they're both valid halakhic opinions, but we follow this one. All of a sudden comes rabbi number two. He doesn't have the authority to argue one against one, so we're still going to take one. But once you have two against one, it follows the same old rule of majority rules. So if I can have two rabbis that would agree on something, albeit for different reasons, and they argue on the one opinion, so logically you would say the majority rules over the minority. That's where the logic comes from. This is a Torah rule. Achei Rabin, we have a rule of like if uh, three pieces of meat fall into a pot and two of them are kosher, so all three of them are kosher. Because the majority rules. You're not sure which is which, majority rules. It's an old halakha. The Sanhedrin was founded on this rule. So let's give you this following scenario. The Talmud says, Kol bi'isha irva. The voice of a lady is similar to seeing her undressed. It's very attractive. And the philosophy behind it is that if a lady has a nice voice, men could be very attracted to them. To maybe understand this better, the things which attract men to women are very different than things that attract women to men. It's a generalization. There are men who are much deeper than that. And there are ladies that are much more shallow than that. But the general working order of the world, men will very often be attracted to a, an external uh, a look, an appearance, a quality, as opposed to the real essence of a person. Ladies, again, there are exceptions to this rule, are very rarely swept off their feet by something that's very superficial. And normally, if it doesn't stand the test of is there something deeper, then it doesn't last so long. It's for that reason why you always find in relationships a lady can say, I love you, and the man has a hard time doing it. Why? It's a different personality. The Torah was very aware there are two different personalities. Now, is it a generalization? Of course it's a generalization. Like everything else in the world is a generalization, so there are always going to be exceptions to this rule. But, that being said, Hashem says, listen, I have daughters. And I don't want you falling in love with them for the wrong reason. So, first you're going to know her. You're going to want to know her. You're going to marry her. You can listen to her sing all day long. But until then, you ever been to a teenage boy's room and see all the movie stars? He has pictures in his walls of, or singers. It's a crazy world you live in. All kinds of singers. His favorite. I once heard a high school with me. Oh, I'm in love with that singer. What are you in love with? I don't even know him. If you would come to see him, he wouldn't even let you into his house. What do you love him? Because the external part of it, it's a very real feeling. It's a very real emotion. And therefore, it was considered something that men don't listen to ladies sing. It's a standard Jewish halakha. Although it's a rabbinic halakha. But it's a halakha nonetheless. Comes along Rabbi Weinberg and says, So how can you get around this rule? I mean, you're sitting at a table. I can hear her singing Shalom Alechem. How is it that she's able to sing and I'm able to hear Step in, Miriam. Who's Miriam? Miriam, Moshe's sister. She's leaving Egypt, and? She's playing the tambourine and she's singing. Now tell me what Art Scroll tells you. They were very far away. Yeah. That's not true. They were separate from the men. No, that's not true, true. Sure, it's true. Ask, ask one of your kids who goes to Jewish school. <laughs> Says Rabbi Weinberg, how could you have, how could she have sung in front of all these people? Come in Dvorah, the prophetess. Dvorah starts singing. They're all going to war. I mean, it's not a, there, there were no mechitzot around there or something like that. How is she singing? I believe it's the Chida, Rabbi Chaim Yosef David Azulai from Morocco. And he says that a lady who sings a holy song is not in the category of forbidden singing of a lady to hear. She, what is she singing about? You listen to her sing. She's singing about Hashem. About the miracles that Hashem has done. If that's going to cause you to do an avera, you have some serious problems. You hear the logic? Yes. Yeah. That's how he justifies it. You don't. Tell me. It's the voice that the man is attracted to. It's not the words that he's attracted to. So they're justifying it by the words that it's words to a shame. But really would, would the content not change the feeling of a person? I don't know to a man because, like you said, I mean, 
I will not be attracted to it. In your years of experience. Would I be attracted to... I could hear. Maybe words. maybe it's not accurate. I don't hear words. To, in music. I hear music. I don't hear words. When the person sings. I hear music. Okay. Somebody who's hearing the words, and the words are... Uh, they're promiscuous. They're they're not so tsanua. So that's more attractive than uh, you're gonna hear some lady. She's gonna sing to you about God all day long. There's nothing. Uh, which guy wants that? And so he says this is the way they were able to get off the hook. But it's not. It's not a good argument on its own. Because the difference between Dvorah and Miriam and somebody sitting at my Shabbat table. Tell me, what's the difference? What's the difference in their song that they're singing? Not about them. Them, obviously, those are the Imot Alam, the mothers of the world. But what's the difference in their, in the content, in the words? The way they're singing. Right, close. One of their prophets, Hashem put into their mouths the song. What, they're going to tell us, I'm sorry Hashem, you gave us a prophecy, but hey, the rabbis say we can't sing it. They're prophetesses. When they receive a prophecy, they say it. The lady at your Shabbat table is not a prophetess. She's reading from the book. This is not something that the moment demands that she must say out loud. And so many rabbis argue with the Chida and strike down his opinion. There's another rabbi that's Dei Chembin. It could be I'm confusing the two rabbis. Which one said which opinion? Forgive me. Also, a Sephardic rabbi from Hebron, Rabbi Chizkiel Medini, was a famous, an old school of Sephardic rabbis. Is I have a different answer, especially regarding Miriam. There's a halakha regarding now is Rosh Hashanah right around the corner. You know, mm-hmm. I know it's a Shabbat next week, but now is Rosh Hashanah. Yes. Like, you want to hear a shofar being blown? So in the Beit Knesset, someone's blowing the shofar, and you hear the shofar. You fulfilled your mitzvah of hearing the shofar. What if you're at the kotel? And there are ten people blowing shofar in different parts of the services. And you're listening to your guy blowing the shofar. But the other guy at the next table is blowing his shofar. And the one on the other side is blowing his shofar. And the one up there is blowing his shofar. Are you really hearing the voice of your shofar? No. You're hearing the voice. Is it easy to focus on? No. No, it's a combination of things. If a lot of people are playing music together in a symphony. That's right. Are you really able to focus in on one no, music no, instrument? No, no, you hear music. Right. And therefore, the rabbis have a term in Masechet Rosh Hashanah. Terei Kale, two voices, kol, two voices. La Mishtamayi, you cannot hear them. When you have two things happening at the same time, you cannot actually single one of them out. Well, and it's for this reason that if you're at the Kota and two people are blind Shufal, you actually would have to blow shofar again in your house. Because you're not able to fulfill the mitzvah of blowing shofar when two people are doing it at once. I have a question. Sure. So here you're mentioning Miriam in the, in the Torah, and you're mentioning Dvorah afterwards. Yes, there were prophets. So are we doubting what uh, God actually um, allowed the people to hear? And the rabbis comes around and they say, no, what God did, and they're excusing what He's done, and they creating their own um, one voice. No, God quite two voices is good. Quite the contrary. We know that we're not allowed to hear a lady sing. We know who's it's we, part of our oral tradition. Know? Us, those who have a tradition from Moshe Rabbeinu, when Hashem gave us the Torah, He also gave us these rules. In the oral law. Yeah. We also know that Dvorah and Miriam knew the oral law, yet they still sang out loud. So we're not trying to say, so how do we get around what God did? The other way around. We're trying to say, what are we not understanding that we think that what they're doing is wrong? We have to find a way to realize that what they did was right. And by that, change the way Halakha works. So we came and said that because they were prophets... That was one opinion. Okay. Meaning the ladies cannot sing out loud unless Hashem is giving them a prophecy to sing. Okay. One opinion. Okay. And the other opinion? Along comes this opinion. No. They weren't singing alone. They were singing together. Like Bloy the Shofar. Two Shofar voices at the same time. 
you cannot single out one of them, in which case, what is it, a whole group of women is going to be attractive? Yeah. You can't single out one person, and therefore that's okay. Says the Sridesh, neither of these answers hold enough water on their own. Because they were both prophetesses and they were both singing holy songs and they were singing together. And therefore he said the following. If at the Shabbat table the men are also singing with the women, the women are singing together, and they're singing Shabbat songs, then it's okay. Because no one's out the other. Very good. And, and because now both reasons apply, both holy songs Correct. and you can hear the it's a group. Very good. Yes. But if it's one person singing, it's a problem. Or if it's a non-holy song, it's a problem. Rabbi, yes. Or, according to this opinion, you could, just like Miriam did. Although, you're right, the standard would be to do it together. That's what the Sri Deja is suggesting. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be holy music. It would have to be uh, uh, songs of kedusha. And so maybe I'll take us a step further. Many American summer camps rely on this opinion of the Sri Daesh to let people do, like you said, presentations together, or let them do all kinds of things together. In the same book that Rabbi Weinberg wrote, that men and women can sing together Jewish songs. He has a whole letter that boys and girls cannot be together in the same camp, or the same production for that matter. So those who choose one of his letters, and ignore his other letter, are essentially doing him, you're, you're stealing his opinion, but you're not following him, actually. He was talking about Shabbat tables, people are, it's a spiritual environment, people are mature, people are, he didn't warrant boys and girls to run around together in a mountain somewhere, and that wasn't, he didn't say that was okay. And so we have to take his letters into context. This being said, Weinberg was definitely a visionary. He was a person who saw... He, he answered questions that his world might have not been struggling with yet. But we today, these are big questions in the world of the rabbinate, the world of Jewish law, the modern Shabbat table. These are big things that come up. When we went, came to San Diego, Sidvara had come from a world where, like I said, nobody sings at the table. I had come from a world which was quite the contrary. You want to tell the truth? Off the record, we're Sephardic, so a lot of these things were very. My grandmother, Motzei Shabbat, had a little. I'll tell you what it was. You know those cookie boxes that are made out of metal? And you always hope there are cookies inside, but instead yes. there's like sewing equipment inside. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. yes. So my grandmother had one of those, but it was big. <laughs> and she used to drum on it. She was a drummer. She would play on the thing. The reason, by the way, she played in a cookie box, most people don't know. In the Yemenite tradition, you're not allowed to play music so long as the temple is not standing in Jerusalem. That's the authentic Jewish approach. The Talmud, the, the Rambam, the Shulchan Aruch all say that until the Bet HaMikdash will be rebuilt, Jews cannot listen to music. How do we get around it? A different class for a different time. But in the Yemenite Jewry, they were the only group of Jews that actually followed this halakha. So you were allowed to play music, just it couldn't be with a real instrument. So that's why she used to play in a cookie box. And not on, if you ever listen, by the way, to Yemenite music, I don't know, maybe the Israelis among you know, mm -hmm. you'll always hear the cookie box in the, in the background. It's part, it's an instrument, I'm not joking. Listen, for example, forgive me for the reference, Ofra Chaza has a Im Ninalu Daltein Nididim, right? It's a famous song. You'll hear the introduction to that song, it's a cookie box. Yes. Yes. It's part of the Yemenite Jewish music scene. Try it. Go to YouTube, put it in, you'll hear the cookie box. She's great singer, by the way. She was. Chaza. Uh, one second. Give me one second. I'll... Does somebody have a phone with internet by any chance? With YouTube? That way you'll know what I'm talking My grandmother did this every Motei Shabbat. Is your grandmother still alive? No, that's no, she passed away. On top of the fridge, Jocelyn had a stick. She would chase after you with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I play a song with you? Yes. 
Listen to the beginning. The rest of it is not so wrong. Not that far. <laughs> Wait. You see that? That that is the cookie box. You'll hear, hear it again. <laughs> that all of our grandmothers played this. So wait, they were so, playing on the cookie box, but these. Yeah, obviously. I mean, today it's a it's a modern yeah. it's a modern song, but we all heard our grandmother. I mean, I don't know about you, but in our circles, our grandmothers sang and our mothers sang and they danced. And, but it was within a family uh, setting. My grandmother, if someone came over to the house, she was Yemenite. She would like hide in the back somewhere. There was a a different world, but so we were a little bit less. Uptight about these things. And and the women, um, vocal, their voice, you know, the 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 Do you know how many rabbis have written letters about if a lady can go in public? And the answer to it is obviously yes. They've been doing it for two thousand years, and um, it's not considered singing. That's the, oh. the attitude. It's a sound really? It's it's a sound sound it sounds like they're gonna go to war, <laughs> and then it's like, a, like a like a battle cry. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you think it's music? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Depends how they do it. I've heard. Oh, I've heard some. I'll tell you a different. Ones. I don't know if you've ever seen um, have the The Muslims have this still, but it's a Jewish tradition. It's found in Shulchan Aruch that at a funeral, we should never have to be them. Halacha is that you must hire what they call mialelot. The criers. 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 Yeah. Professional criers. Wailers. They were ladies yeah. that went up to funerals. They start to wail. And they inspired other people to cry by. They were right. practiced and fake crying. <laughs> they were trained how to make sounds of people crying, mm -hmm. and they would come to funerals and they would scream and they were there, and people would cry with them. The Greeks still do. A lot of cultures still have this. So what's that behind it? It's meant to inspire people to cry. It's a funeral. We don't have to have those people. I mean, I've been to. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, all funerals are pretty intense. It was a Jewish, a Jewish custom that what, it was like. Um, it, it phased out about 500 years ago, 400. I don't know when it phased out, but you can imagine if someone tried to do it today. Oh, how can ladies be singing? It's not singing. This is screaming your head off. Uh, it's a crying sound. So I think the song that you were just playing. So it's okay if she sings in public, a single woman. But, but she's, it's not live. Very good. So I'm relying on uh, I'm relying on a different opinion. Mm -hmm. oh, she's pushing me out. Marlene is. Uh... I. <laughs> Want to the answer? Sure. <laughs> I thought I was going to get to my letter today. Chacham of Yosef was not from the most liberal of of Orthodox rabbis. His favorite singer. Do you know? Who's the singer? Um, Chacham Ovadia Yosef. Not a Chazan somewhere? What, a lady no. singer? Yeah, sure. The one you just played? No. 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 Oh, no, was that the one that's the one No, no, she, she wasn't Jewish. Oh, she wasn't oh, Jewish? Right. Her name was, I don't know how to pronounce it, Um Kultum. Have you heard of her? Oh, my goodness. No. She's like a terrorist from Egypt. Oh, his She hates Jews. I don't know if she's still alive. What? what? It's the Mexican time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Chacham Ovadia Yosef started his career of a rabbi as the chief rabbi of Egypt when he was 20 yes. years old. Yes. Why? She used to have these songs five hours long. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, they, 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 yeah, they last forever, these songs. So, Chacham Abad Yosef loves her music. Okay, point. Therefore, how did he justify listening to it? That's the question. Now, by the way, if I would tell you, Rav Yashiv listened to, uh, you would think, what is he, Jewish? Was he Orthodox? Was he? But he wasn't attracted to her. So Chamavadi had two things. If the words in the song are not um, promiscuous, and I guess you have to understand Arabic to know what you're saying, because I don't you're understand right. a word she's saying. <laughs> Obviously there were some songs you felt you could not listen to. But some songs, they were not, um, they were not, they were Tzenua lyrics, they were about the world, or about whatever they were about. And you also don't know what she looks like. It's not a concert, you're not there alive. And you're, it's not a CD, you don't have to... So what could be wrong with that? Well, he has, he has his own imagination of what you would do. Right. Very good. 
But then again, are you not allowed to sit, when you sit in a chair? You can imagine all kinds of things. You can't sit in a chair. So Chamavari Yosef allowed this. Uh, and it's a famous thing with Saladim. We've always had such things in our circles. And it's, it's what I told you once, like six months ago. We're very happy that people don't know so much about Saladim. Because if they did, they wouldn't, they wouldn't consider us Jewish. It's a different... Uh, no, we, we have things that... If I would tell you that the Lubavitcher Rebbe listened to, I don't know... Uh, I'm afraid to even tell you what I would tell you would listen to. You would think, of, how can I ever listen to him again? How can I ever read from his him again? By us, this was a normal... But he was a normal man. I mean, he was not a, a special But you expect person. him to be a tzaddik, right? Mm-hmm. I, I expect well, if him you're to be that, a human being uh, that saw lots of things but didn't just see that. He saw the world for what it was. And he accepted the world for what it was. Just that he had his own group of people that... So differently, but that's not real. Talking about accepting. That's what the Surah Ash came to talk about today. It's a good segue. And what about the YouTube? You watch something, you actually see the person. Right, so watching would be a problem. Do you just listen? Like going to some kind of play or a show or whatever it would be, would be a problem. It's interesting when you say extent of accepting. So if we go back to the basic of and while you're talking, would you just hand these out, please? Take one, pass it around. Yes. Of believing, Thank you. In, believing in God. So we went to believing in the rabbis, the different rabbis. Did okay. everyone need the phantom? Is it? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. yes. We have this one. <laughs> so, um, so here you're talking about uh, a rabbi that is off from the tradition a little bit. And we are thinking if the person is not perfect, which nobody is perfect. I brought it up the other day in a good Thank conversation, you. and Moshe was one that didn't believe when God told him to hit the rock, and he didn't believe it. He didn't believe that that's what's going to happen, that the water was going to come out. So evidently, God punished for it because he was supposed to completely believe in what Hashem It's I mean, here is Hashem is talking to him. And he doesn't believe it. So, come back to our parents. We don't believe, but we know it's our parents, but we don't always listen to them either. So here comes a rabbi, and he's got this opinion, and this one's got this opinion. Why don't we understand that even the greatest rabbi, which was Moses, didn't believe Hashem when he told him to do something, and therefore, Human can have different perceptions, but you don't deny them because of their different perception. Who said that we deny them? Well, you just mentioned a rabbi. Oh, they, yeah, okay, I understand. He had a different idea about something that is against the norm. This doesn't come from a Jewish value. It comes from a human insecurity. When someone is different than me, they must be... They, ju- they just must be wrong. It's, it's not a Jewish yeah, value. It's, a, Jewish it's a human insecurity. No, no it's a human thing. You don't see this in politics all day long? Absolutely. I see that all the time, but I see it If someone's Jews a Republican, say. they don't see any good ever. A Democrat could say the same thing, but they'll never see it. Why? Because that, and the other way around, if a Democrat or if a Republican says something... I think it's, we're about to have a third party, I just heard today. Really? Yay! It's about time. I mean, a donkey and an elephant, and what's going to be now? I have no idea what that would be, but Trump is so will not back down, will not apologize to the extent that somebody interviewed him said that it looks like there's going to have to be another party. In this regard, I'm very proud to be Israeli. <laughs> I don't get involved. Oh. Oh. Elephants, the elephants there's and the donkeys enough, enough. can fight with each other all day long. <laughs> doesn't make a difference to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably there'll be three parties, four parties. There already are parties. There's already still. It's a normal thing that people have a struggle with someone who's different than them. So now it just translates into the Jewish world, and it shouldn't be that way, but it, it, it happens. It's a normal human reaction. This letter, written by Rev. Weinberg, is in this book called Lifrakim. It's two volumes. It's uh, different essays on Jewish thought. On I've, I've cut out different paragraphs for you because the letter is very long. And... It's an open letter to the non-religious half of the state of Israel. 
I guess it must be a response to something because I don't know what prompted this letter. But it was an open letter, like a letter where he said, I'm putting my guts out on paper. I'm going to explain to you exactly how it is that we, the religious Jews, feel in Israel. And what I loved about this letter, I don't necessarily agree with every letter inside of it. But was the attitude that was very different than anything you've ever heard before, or I've ever heard before. We're taught a lot about tolerance, of unity, of all kinds of things. During the nine days especially, oh, unity this, and unity that, and unity... Everyone's talking about Ahavat Yisrael, and loving everybody, and blah, blah, blah. But they don't actually... Def- what does that mean? Ahavat Yisrael. So I see Jews that are murderers. I'm supposed to love them? No. Why not? What do you mean? But I have to love every Jew. There's even a song. To love a fellow Jew. Just I know that it's not the same. Okay, so that was an extreme example. What the example was done to show was that we would all agree that there are situations where some of these rules are not values in and of themselves. Exactly. Unity. Am I supposed to unite with people that are bad? The United Nations. Forget its stance on Israel for a moment. It's not not a nice stance. Forget it for a moment. The fact that countries that are terrorist countries are sitting together with modern... Uh, advanced countries and they're united it's a united is that a good thing or a bad thing it's a bad, bad thing right now the world says well, it's a good thing they're all sitting at the same table and yeah. dialoguing yeah. am I supposed to dialogue you know there's a famous American policy I guess yeah. until recently we don't negotiate with terrorists you know this teaching oh good that was yeah. great right? mm-hmm. you know when I heard yeah, it when, when did I hear it the first time my roommate got engaged to a girl whose father didn't want him to be his son-in-law and so he called up his future father and said, you know, I'm going to engage to your daughter. He said, I don't want you to get engaged to her. So he said, well, okay, when, when do you think that I'll be, well, she'll be ready enough for me to marry her? He said, I don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> that was his, his answer. If they got married, they have a kid today, Bo Hashem, he's a rabbi, you know, those kind of things. But terrorists, we, we don't, yeah, of course. We don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> Why don't you negotiate with terrorists? Isn't dialogue a good thing? I think it depends on the dialogue and depends on the people who are giving the dialogue. I think that it, if I look at what's happening in this country today... Well, we, we certainly have these catchphrases. We're raised on these catchphrases. Equality. Do you really believe in that? Maybe you do. Well then, does it apply to everyone, to everything? You believe in equality, right? So what about illegal immigrants? Where's their equality? Or maybe it's not for everyone. It's only for certain people. Okay, well then it's not equal. We're, we're raised on certain... I once told you that in the abortion dispute here in America, Judaism believes that both sides are right and both sides are wrong. So I'm, I'm letting you know that that's the Jewish opinion. But they don't word it as for abortion or anti-abortion. Rather, the words they use are pro-life, pro-life and pro-choice. 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 Why do they use those words? Because it sounds different. Mm-hmm. Well, the there was a famous Nazi philosopher, Joseph yeah. Goebbels, Goebbels, I don't know how you pronounce Goebbels. it. Goebbels. Goebbels. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he said, He who masters the language has won the war. Mm-hmm. You gotta know the words that you choose. See, when you say pro life, who can in their right mind be against life? You already won by using the word pro-life. Are you against life? I'm not against life. I'm against... No, but you're against... See, you're against the pro-life. What about pro-choice? Which democratic citizen of the United States of America doesn't want to have a choice? And so what they've done is they've packaged words, but in better words. And all of a sudden, you? You're a fanatic. You're against... I just... They've changed the language on you. And these catchphrases, they dictate the way the world works. So we have Jewish catchphrases. Unity, Yachadut. We have Avat Israel, Avat Chinam, uh, Baseless Love, all kinds of wonderful catchphrases. But what do they mean? How could you be against the Havat Israel? Not against it. I just, there's a different value that's more. No, but you're against love. How could you be against love? How could you be a rabbi and be against unity? Well, you, you termed this thing as unity. I term it as craziness. But you've, you've already won the war because you changed the word. Everything has to have a 
have boundaries. I think it has to have some sort of standards. I mean, otherwise it becomes a lot of big mush. Of course. But this concept is a... If you think about it a lot, you'll realize how much the world has forced us to accept or not accept certain things based on the words they have chosen to describe them. I had a rabbi in yeshiva. I didn't learn about him for very long, maybe two months. And he would come in every morning, his wife would send him with a slice of bread and a little container of tenuva cottage cheese. That was what he came with. Now today, I guess it's very expensive to buy tenuva cottage cheese. But he came in with his container of tenuva cottage cheese and he never ever finished the container. I said, Rabbi, what, what's with you in the container? Why do you never finish it? I don't even know. How much is a, let's say, uh, eight, eight ounces. ounces. Eight ounces, eight you want to say eight ounces? Yes, eight ounces. He says, why should it be that Tanuva decides that I have to have eight ounces for breakfast? <laughs> They've dictated for me that a normal person by breakfast has this many ounces. It's a good song. I want seven ounces. But they don't make seven ounce containers because they don't believe in the seven ounces. But I want seven ounces. Don't let you you eat a, a yogurt from your refrigerator. They're, they're dictating for you. They made them smaller. It is three ounces. Small. They're dictating for you. You eat a bag of potato chips. Why do you have to finish the bag? You don't have to finish the bag. You have a choice. But they've dictated for you that a normal person will eat this bag of potato chips. You have a choice. That's how how they have to sell. That's how they package it. Otherwise, it would kind of have Five million pounds of I understand the practical side of things. It's the philosophical side behind it. Is you it? realize that in every detail you already have something that is it's prepackaged. Very it's very thoughtful behind it. Absolutely. I think it sounds like making problems with your million really hard. It's not a problem. You can eat all your eight ounces. Nobody's stopping you. But you know, when you have you okay. come to America and you buy a gallon of milk in your refrigerator. Yeah. Yes. Suddenly you go to somebody's house who keeps Khalav Islam and they have this little funny uh, what do they call them? Like uh, quart size. They're so oppressed. They don't buy milk and gallons. And then you go to Israel. They get them in little plastic bags. Like, oh look at that! They are so primitive. That's because the world has taught you that a normal person has a gallon of milk in their refrigerator. How many times do people throw away some of the gallon because it got spoiled? It went bad. How many times does it happen? Oh, very good. That's a different. Very good. That's a good question. You should know. By the way, there was a rabbi, and the Ravad was his name. And, and the Ravid the Ravad he says that if you don't eat the he used to have a rule that when you eat your plate of food you should leave one piece of food that you really want to eat don't eat it yes. say I have self controlled I want that last piece of, there's the scoop of ice cream I will not have it because I want to teach myself self control it's called the Tanit HaRavad the fasting of the Ravad he believes that it counts as like a fast day self control and he said so what about throwing it away are you allowed to throw it away he said yes because this food is teaching you self-discipline and that is a valid use for food you're allowed to use food for a purpose it doesn't have to be for eating but also to teach yourself self-discipline you teach yourself self-discipline what is his name? Ra'avad now that Rizal said you shouldn't do this but this was his opinion but, but you have to why are you are you allowed to throw away spoiled food? yes so how are you not allowed to throw away food? Talking words. Oh, very good. That's what I'm telling you. It's true. You're not supposed to throw away food because you're wasting it. But what if throwing away the food is giving me something bigger than eating it? Oh, so then you're allowed to throw it away. I don't know if he threw it away. He just didn't eat it. <laughs> Could be he put it in his backpack for lunch. I, I don't know what he did with it. But basically, he doesn't want. Oh, it's already twelve. Well. Let me control. let me tell you then just an introduction for next week was on For Weinberg in this letter comes to speak about these catchphrases, unity, love of your fellow Jew, that they were being thrown at him as an Orthodox rabbi who was having opinions on certain things. And he talks about a few steps. In order to be united, there have to be a few steps. The first step is to know, know thine enemy. You know that teaching? Yeah. Know who you're up against. Be able to define yourself. What are you? What are you about? 
What do you really want from me? What is your plan for the world? Are you asking me to unite with non-observant Jewry so we could sit together and have a Shabbat meal? Of course I'm okay with that. Or are you asking me to unite so you could infiltrate my school systems? Why are you asking me to unite? Tell me what you're all... Be honest with me about what you're coming to accomplish. He says, who's against unity? He says, but don't you see the first three words? I don't actually know how to pronounce the third word in Hebrew, but it's a, it means phrases. Lo, rak lo, just don't give me phrases. Don't give me catchphrases. Frazot? Is that what you Sismaot. But this is probably written in a time before we use the word sismaot. This is written like in the 40s or 50s. Sismaot? Yeah, that would be the proper word that we would use today. He says, don't throw me catchphrases. You're coming to talk to me about unity? Fine, but tell me what you want to accomplish with your unity. So give them explanation about it. Very good. He says, don't just tell me what you're about. Tell me what you're not about either. Because very often you tell me um, we're about this and we're about that. Or about but in your telling me what you're about, you're also telling me subtly what you're not about. So don't leave it to be subtle. Tell me what you're about. So I'll do the same about myself. But the first part, before we have unity, we have to be honest. Honesty comes before unity. And this is really what I want to speak about today. God willing, we'll speak about it the day after Tisha B'Av. It's still a fitting time. But we throw out phrases. Let's unite. Let's become one. Let's do that. And especially me, in my last two months of history, I've been hearing this a lot. And this teaching of Rav Weinberg was, it's like water to a parched soul. He's telling you, how could you unite if you don't truly understand who you are and who the other person is? Are you aware that you are a threat to me? Am I aware that I am a threat to you? Are we willing to sit at the table and say, our values threaten each other directly. Or are we going to hide behind unity? And will that unity actually last? Or is it better to know, hey, I hate you, you hate me. We also love each other, but we hate each other too. On that basis, now we can know on which things we can unite, and which things we cannot unite. But it's not a politically correct teaching. Because what it tells you is that there are limits to unity. There are conditions to loving other people. And that is not a permissible thing to say. But, but, but in the midst of opening up who we are, and God forbid if I don't like somebody here, um, I'm opening myself, and that person also opens themselves to me. But the fact is that we are communicating... That's step number two. Absolutely. Communication also leads to a certain kind of relationship. Absolutely. Uniting without communication is not really unity. And there's a third step, which I'm not going to speak about right now. I'll just let you know what it is. He says, the catchphrase called tolerance. He said, do not throw it at me. In Hebrew, the word for tolerance is sovlanut. Sovlanut is patience. Sovlanut is this bond, to be able to, to put up with you. And he says something very powerful. He says, I can only tolerate a person if I don't care about what they believe. Listen to this. It's the opposite of what we're told. He said, if I can tolerate you, he says that the, the word that brings to sovlanut is the Hebrew word of adishut, which is um, um, apathy. To be apathetic towards you. I can tolerate you if I don't care about what you believe. If I don't care about what you believe, and then I can say, hey, I don't care what you believe, I still love you. Do you want to be treated in a way that I don't care what you believe? Sister Weinberg, we're brothers. We're all from the same family. We're all Jews. He said, you can be tolerant of people who are not in your family. You could tolerate that guy on the side of the street because you don't really care about him. He says, but I care about you. So how can you ask me to not have any passionate emotion towards you? He said, a passionate emotion would be love. I love you. Says Rav Weinberg, but if I don't love you, the opposite of love is hate. But that hate is a passionate feeling. It comes because we're siblings. How many siblings, when they fight, just, eh, we tolerate each other. We're just apathetic. No. No. Either you love each other, or you hate each other. 
apathetic is not real. It doesn't exist. You can't tolerate a sibling. You can tolerate the guy sitting next to you in the Bithkinesis. That one you can tolerate. You can't tolerate somebody you're close to. And says Rav Weinberg, you're asking me to tolerate you, but by asking me to tolerate you, you're asking me not to love you. And he says, I refuse to give up on the value of love for tolerance. It's black and white, and it's generally about every aspect of the personality person. Well, there's a whole page that we're going to talk about what it is, what it's not. Oh, is that the same? That is for next week. I don't want to. Yeah, Everyone have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. It was wonderful.